All right. Welcome to an exciting episode of Experience Focused Leaders podcast. Uh, I am thrilled to introduce Scott Wharton, who is the general manager of Logitech's B2B business. This is a $2 billion business. I repeat, $2 billion in revenue, not some funky valuation, $2 billion business. Probably everybody who has um, been in the Zoom in the last uh, few years has been using the products of Logitech. Uh, everybody who's been in a video uh, conference room or facility has been using those products. Uh, and you've probably been using software and other amazing products that you didn't even realize you were using. So Scott um, has been a kind of industry luminary. He's uh, been in Davos and he's been at CES. And he'll share with us all sorts of exciting things about what it's going to take to create the future uh, of uh, digital and hybrid experiences that will take your breath away. Without further ado, Scott, would love to hear your story and how you got to your current role. Um, and that would be really fascinating for, for our audience to just understand your journey. Uh, yeah, great. Luminous role. Well, thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me. It's a great topic. I, uh, I mean, I consider my, my logic now, but my background is really more of startup. So um, after business school, I um, was looking to get into renewable energy, but it was too early at the time. So I had to have a backup plan and I found this thing called the internet. And uh, that seemed to have worked out okay. Uh, ended up in the first voice of IP company and uh, started with a very small group. We were the first ones to basically allow you to make free phone calls over the internet through your computer. And uh, went from very early stage to IPO in the crazy times of the dot-com boom. Uh, eventually became the head of marketing for this public company. Um, my wife was from California, so she said, hey, we should go move there. But I got recruited for the startup in Washington, D.C. area. And they were just getting going. And I said, you know what? It's startup, honey. It'll fail. We'll do it for a year or two and then move. And then nine years later, we're getting ready to go public, uh, two kids and a house. And she's like, dude, you, you told me we were going to California. So we ended up moving to Cal Silicon Valley and starting a company. It was the first cloud video conferencing service. So it was three years before Zoom. We were running video on you know, this new thing called Amazon Web Services. We were mm. like, what the hell is that? And... Uh, we ended up selling that company to one of our biggest customers. Um, and people think Logitech bought us, but we didn't. I actually took a year and a half off, um, backpacked around the world, got rid of my house and cars and most of our stuff with our kids. Wait, wait you back how many kids did you have when you backpacked? This is uh... there too, uh, 10, 13 when we when we did it. Okay, that's impressive. Uh, I thought I was impressive that I backed up after business school by myself, but, but that is <laughs> that is an under underperformance. Well done, Scott. <laughs> Total, totally different experience. And then uh, when I got back, there was this opportunity at Logitech, and and I had been a CEO of a company that was running a video cloud service with all the hardware, and Logitech was making hardware that worked with all the cloud services. So I thought it was a great fit, although quite frankly. I had never worked for a big company before. I wasn't even sure if I would be, if I'd like it to be successful. And the recruiters were screening me out from this job because on paper, they said I was not qualified. So a short version is I went around everyone, went to the CEO. He ended, we ended up falling in love. He hired me. And then I, I took this $62, $62 million relatively small business into over a billion dollars at Logitech. Wow. So how, so... So, so this is an amazing journey. Like very few people ever get out of kind of the their niche, right? Like whether it's early stage or or kind of larger larger company. Where and when it comes to to um, uh, to leaders in particular, like where do you? How did you adjust your style to kind of go from zero to one in some cases, or in in other cases, kind of you know grow already something that had some degree of scale. And you know, when we say create experiences, probably the experiences that you create in the early stage are very different than some of the ones that you create in a large organization. How would you yeah. distinguish that, you know, for 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 leaders in particular but, general management and CEO roles? That's a great question. I think there are, I would say probably there are some things that are constant and some that are not. So first of all, I think. The most common mistake I think people make is they take one experience that they have and they assume that everything is exactly the same. 
and they take the same template and they apply it, usually it's not the case. So I think the first thing is you have to go in with an open mind. Mm -hmm. And all right, say, so obviously, we all go in with some experience, so there's some value in that, but there's some things you just don't know, or some things that may be different. I think you kind of have to assess what, what do you take from your background that works? And quite frankly, what do you take that's wrong? Uh, I think that's number one. And the second thing is having a clear strategy um, that everyone can understand is really important. It needs to be really simple. It cannot be complicated. And then the other thing is uh, surrounding yourself with really good people that know how to execute. Because I think, mean, you know, as they say, a vision without execution is a hallucination. So ultimately, I think you have to surround yourself with really good people. And uh, I think part of what I've been really fortunate is finding great people, kind of empowering them and almost, you know, not hands off, but letting them do what they do. Uh, I think that that's, that's kind of the formula. And then, and then part of it is just every day you got to sweat the details about what you're doing. And uh, you know, when I started with Logitech, I had this vision of maybe being a billion dollar business, but people thought I was nuts. And then mm. we ended up we ended up actually doing it, but I had no idea how to get there. But I think we did have a clear vision how to get there. I think that's often the case when you're starting something else. You, you have to know where you're going, um, even if you don't know how you're going to get there. So, so tell us, you know, what, well, for most people, when they think Logitech, they think of something that they're buying as a, as a consumer, right? Or, or they're, you know, they're getting for their home, for their kids, for, you know, maybe as a, cons you know, prosumer in some cases, but you've built this, you know, incredible um, B2B uh, platform uh, that outsources many pure play B2B businesses, right? So tell us a little bit about, about how did you create co-create these two um two businesses was in you know overall a brand that is you know we don't think of as a consumer brand at least uh the the pedestrian the, the folks that are not in the industry and what were the particular unique challenges that you had to um deal with and bring into the b2b platform or what the advantages did you have maybe uh, as part of having this consumer brand that was well known well, when I started, it was about eight years ago, and, and Logitech is absolutely a consumer brand. Most of our sales were low-end mice and keyboards. Um, mm -hmm. It was about $2 billion a year, and we weren't really growing. We were growing about 2% a year. So it's kind of a low-growth, you know, mature company. Uh, I think part of what I, what I was able to do is, is uh, really focus on the fact that we needed a small, dedicated team that had a different culture. And... Uh, I was lucky enough that I was able to convince my boss, the CEO, to, to let us be incubated and run things in a very different way. So I think part of our success was um, pull, actually pulling things in a way out of the main group. So under the umbrella with the investment of Logitech, but really not beholden. Because I think one of the things that's a challenge, I think, for any company is hmm. you have something that works and you have a culture. And I think most of the people listening, it, it's so hard to change the culture of any company. So we were able to change fundamentally, create this B2B enterprise oriented, software oriented brand and team and skill set that was different. And then once we were able to do that, then we were able to you know, show some success and build upon that. But I would say it was a constant challenge for me where I would work with people and they would go, I don't get it. Why are you doing this way? You know, This is different than the consumer world. And we'd have to explain them that enterprise was different. And I'm sure that almost everyone listening has some of their own experience where you know you struggle from a cultural point of view. So I'd say the number one lesson I learned is if you have anything that is different from the main thing, you got to break it out. Um, I think another lesson for me is focus Trump scale, I think almost all the time. Mm. So if any, I would say if anything is if you're working on something and it's less than 10% of your time, you're going to fail. So take people who are working on something that is less than 10% of their time and make it 100% of the time, immediately you're going to get focus and impact it's part of the reason why startups succeed but i think it's also i think it's a lesson that i learned that you can apply into big companies too you just usually don't do it that way because you think oh i'm scale i'm big but if nobody's focused on something you know that's why startups will kick big companies asses that's so fascinating so what, what we hear with some of our clients they kind of have culture like if, especially if they acquire a lot of companies they don't try to force it all in immediately they create this sort of inclusive a culture of cultures which allows some like there's some core themes but then allows a lot of 
uh, autonomy. And it sounds like what you're describing, you know, is is in this case, like you had a lot of autonomy, you've maintained it, and that was a secret to building, a, you know, a, a truly scalable uh, business. And if you were to do it again, this would be the same approach, maybe a kind of another division um, that you would take, right? I think that's true. And even as our group has gotten bigger, I've had to confront some of the same things. So for example, we, uh, you know, Logitech right now in video conferencing, we're the world leader. We beat Cisco and Poly. Um, we've got about 32% market share. When I started, it was almost zero. Um, so we now have this big group and a culture that's established within the company. Um, but as I try to cultivate new things, like we wanted to create a services business, and as you can imagine, a company that's used to making hardware to do services is almost impossible because every, everything, the way, the way you think about it is different. So even there, I had to create a smaller group that was walled off and incubated and dedicated to doing services that wasn't polluted by, you know, hardware thinking. Um, and now we've just launched a, a flexible desk business that's really fundamentally different from hardware in conference rooms. So it's kind of the same idea. Don't have that be, you know, small percentage of people's jobs, create a small group dedicated every day, have them wake up and be focused on it. Now, part of the overall umbrella and strategy and ultimately the sales team, but making sure that the people who are actually doing it are dedicated. I think it's just critical and it's amazing to me how simple it is, but how people just don't, they don't do it. So, so if I translate this, it sounds like you started with who are your customers and what's the offer for them and then work backwards to create the right organization, the right, the right culture to address that, that need. Is that kind of a, another way of thinking about this, right? In a, in a service business, you have one type of experience, service experiences that you need to create in a, in a hardware business that's B2B through sort of working through distribution channels. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a different mindset, different, different customer. Therefore you have to start with a customer and work backwards. Is that kind of a good way to think about this or did, was there something internal that you've uh you've built on um when you're starting these new platforms well i think it's two things one is understanding if your culture of the group that you need the skill set you need is different and then separating them but i would also say i think part of how we were successful is that we and i think this is just a good idea in general is to you have to answer the question for you and your team what business are you in and i think a lot of times the answer is too narrow so what, like, for example, when I started, I think the answer I got from people said, what business are you in? They'd say, oh, we make cameras. And my answer is, no, we don't make cameras. We, we make meetings. Right. We're helping people do meetings. And when you think about meetings, all right, what does a meeting involve? It's not just a camera. It's audio. It's video. It's cabling. It's the so-called 15 minutes that it used to take to start a meeting. So we actually made a computer touch controller and then started venturing out into you know, even things like we make computers now, because that's part of the meeting business. So think if you if you start out with a very narrow technical view, one, I think it'll it'll limit you to what you should do to solve the customer problem. And uh, you know, I, I think it's like a classic example of Jeffrey Moore had this idea of the whole product. Mm. What does your customer actually need to solve the problem? And oftentimes what people do is they're like, I'm solving this, and you're like, but this is a feature. Um what you really need to solve is the whole problem. It also, I think, opened our minds up to saying, you don't need to do everything yourselves, but you need to make sure it works. So for mm. example, we came up with this idea of, a, of like a kit where we'd meet in the channel and we decided, all right, we were making video conferencing, audio and video, but we didn't want to make computers because, you know, Lenovo, Dell, et cetera. But we knew we needed to work with them to make it easier to buy, consume, integrate. So we came up with this kit idea. And I remember... You know, people were really mad at me. They're like, what are you doing? You're making us like a systems integrator. But, you know, the the irony is everybody in the industry has copied us after that because we really lowered the, you know, the friction for adopting solutions. And I that's one of my North Stars is thinking about this, this Jeffrey Moore crossing the chasm whole product idea. So, so it sounds like this is this is one of the one of the advantages is you just kind of reworked uh, what the definition is of the market, you know, to, to us, we hear, you know, the tremendous kind of momentum that the video conferencing space and the, I guess, meeting space has had, um, how would you distinguish between what's happening externally and the pool you get from the market? And then this, what, what you're describing, which is kind of how you're approaching to meet those needs. Did you, 
anticipate what's going to happen? Was it, you know, was it a surprise, obviously, like was COVID situation? And how were you able to capture that opportunity uh, when it happened? Yeah, I think, I think you know, there are always going to be people who say, oh, uh, so in COVID, our business tripled in a year. Mm -hmm. And it was a terrible time, but unbelievable from a professional point of view. And we and like it, like a lot of other companies, we had incredible shortages and we had to spend a lot of our time, second, third, eight sourcing stuff, you know, really crazy. I, but I would say, you know, some people say we were lucky and of course we were to some degree, but we were prepared and ready. And, you know, our business tripled, but our competitors did not. Like many wow. of our competitors went down. And I think... That wasn't a coincidence. I think we put ourselves in the right position to be ready to take advantage of the hyper growth. And I think that's, that's I guess my advice would say to people is you never know what external factor is going to hit or there'll be some acceleration, but, um, but you can be prepared and ready to be in the right place at the right time, which is some luck, but it's not all luck. So, so this is a little, we covered a little bit of the, of the past. Um, and speaking of being prepared for the future, right? Like I, I saw the the Dallas work that you did about like what what would the future look like in twenty thirty. So guide our audience a little bit on what's your vision of the meeting, uh, in in the in the future, right? Like Facebook has one or Meta has one vision. Uh, you may have yeah. a, you know a different approach. Um, you've obviously have a track record of creating this kind of the two billion dollars worth of meeting experiences. You know, what What can we expect? And then also, what do we need to prepare for besides buying Logitech products um, in terms of as, as individuals to create, you know, better meeting experiences and outcomes, I would say. Like, that's probably your, you're in the meetings outcome business, right? Like, it's not just the meeting business, but, you know, yeah. are the meetings able to get stuff done uh, and, you know, either be seamless or wow, but one of the two, right? Like, so... Guide us a little bit on that, and what should we be worried about? What we're not doing because the future is doing it, and what what's um, what are already the best that kind of the leading customers are doing that you see. So well, sometimes your inspiration comes from unexpected places, and sometimes it's deliberate. So I'll, I'll tell two stories um, that gives an example of both. So when, shortly after I started with Logitech, I was a uh, I was watching a lot of basketball with my son, who at the time was twelve. And we were watching the Golden State Warriors, and it was the you know the best season ever that they ever had. And we were watching a lot of games at home, and I thought it'd be really fun to take him to a game. Uh, bear with me; this has this has something to do with video conferencing. And uh, and I said, "Hey, hey, how would you like to go to the game?" And he says, he looks at me and he thinks about it. He goes, "No, I don't want to go." And I'm like, why? You know, we we love watching the games. It's fun. It's a bonding. And he looks at me and he goes, well, first of all, his dad, I think you're kind of a cheapskate, so you'll be up in the nosebleed seats. So our view won't be you know, quite as good as watching the TV. It's a startup because... experience, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then and then he, he's like, well, and then you get the statistics and the multiple cameras. So, you know, you get the better views. And then he goes, I can pause it when I go to the bathroom and I don't have to sit in traffic. Um, and I love the announcers. And the analysis and i'm listening to him talk and you know up until that time and then when people talked about video conferencing the the conventional wisdom was video is good but if you want to have a better experience you need to meet someone in person right so here's this 12 year old telling me dad that's bullshit. it's better to be a remote and i was contemplating that thinking why and he basically laid out this idea that became our, our North Star and our vision for the video group. So we came up with this idea of we want video to be better than being there. Mm. What is that? Not just as good. But what is better be, better than being there? It meant the same thing that you get from sports, multiple cameras, insights, analytics, pausing, you know, all these things. So over the last eight years, we've basically been building that out. So we now have a sol solution that we just launched that has multiple cameras, AI moving director, insights, analytics. In some ways, we're not quite near that, but we're, 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 we're getting to a point now where your view from being at home might be better than sitting in a long conference room. Now, we have a long way to go to kind of keep filling up that vision, but I would say the vision really came from my 12-year-old son, ultimately, and you kind of have to listen sometimes, and sometimes the inspiration comes from different things. So that was the... Uh, that was the one that was unexpected. 
then we we uh, we did this other thing pre-pandemic. I got together a group of uh, interdisciplinary experts, and I wanted to challenge the idea of a meeting. Like, how do you make a meeting better? And part of the thinking behind it was, if you ask most people, how good are your meetings from a scale of one to ten? They'll say three. Basically, most people say meetings suck. And the other observation is that meetings, with all the technology around us, chat GPT and airplanes and all this stuff, meetings haven't really changed. If you were in ancient Rome and you went 2,500 years back, your meeting would look very similar to how you did it today. I'm curious, did you have a study which which kind of compared the meetings that include a presentation software and the meetings without, with, 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 <laughs> without it? Was it all, all three or did you notice a difference in that in that research? Well, I think this meeting, what we, what we did is more basic. So we got together a whole bunch of people that came from different disciplines. So we had yeah. obviously meeting scientists and technologists, but we had Andrew Huberman coming before he was really famous on his podcast talking about neurology. And we had people who came out of professional sports. We had the general manager of the San Antonio Spurs. People came out of the military. You know, the people that are, deliver high performance, not necessarily in business, but in different areas. We had someone in the clergy, like how do you, and uh, here's what we, here's what we got out of that. We said, all right, 70% of making meetings better is, is stuff we already know how to do. Video conferencing, having an agenda, right. being right. inclusive. 25% of it was needing, what we said at the time is we need an AI agent. This is way before chat GPT and other things. An AI agent that would watch all of our meetings and tell us how to do it better. And then there was 5% saying, our brains are too slow. We need an Elon Musk like you know, neural link implant in our brains to speed up how we wow. communicate. So that's, you know, the last part's, you know, farther away. But the AI stuff, I think ironically, we were pretty close to I think what's starting to happen now with generative AI. So that was more of a deliberate, like, all right, how do you think about where this is going and what do you need? Well, this is really, both topics are really fascinating. I mean, I think I could reflect at least on, on our journey. And I think I, I will share this so that everybody could start connecting to this. So we we kind of, we're joking about uh, presentation. So one of the things that we do it relate to is reimagine the presentation, which oftentimes happens in meetings. But oftentimes yeah. there's, these sort of presentation books, and then also eBooks uh, that are consumed on on your own. And, um, you know, frankly, the last innovation in that has been, you know, Jeff Bezos coming out was a Kindle uh, in, in kind of very black and white mode. And yeah. you know, a lot of people are coming back and saying, hey, I'm not really getting satisfied. It's convenient, but I'm not really getting a great reading experience it's it's not really enriching it I'm, I'm not moving from reading to execution or applying that and so yeah. we've we we are very much a, like I, I love what you're describing because we literally said like how can we make the on-screen reading experiences as compelling and more compelling than the traditional book which is still kind of the the one that kind of forces the most concentration and um and has been sort of the, the high standard. So I, I think that's very relevant. You know, so if you're anybody else, right, like listening to the podcast, this this feels like the universal truth. Kind of go for the big the big mission of what you're trying to change and kind of rethink, you know, set set against a very high standard, right? Like you weren't setting the bar against the competition in this yeah. exercise. You were singing against the fundamental human activity of meetings. Absolutely. And I think part of what you're saying too uh, is kind of looking backward and saying, what's the best experience? Maybe it doesn't even exist today and you kind of work your way backward. I yeah. think why that's useful is I think if what most people do is they look and say, how do I incrementally improve? So in your case, it may be like, how do I make the PDF slightly better? Well, that's kind of missing the whole point. Like the PDF's not that great. Yeah. The experience is broken in so many ways. So you looked at it from a future point of view. And I think we did the same thing. And I think that's what a lot of people, it's a great exercise to kind of unconstrain yourself and say, what is, what is great look like? And then you realize what you're doing today as good as it might be is quite frankly, is not that good. So when, when you're coming up with these futuristic experiences, right. And, and the kind of introducing innovation, how do you, you, you know, how do you think about who are the early adapters, especially at a business of your scale, but you're clearly, rolling out a lot of new things. You have a very broad product portfolio. 
Um, how do you find them? Do you do you, do you kind of uh, uh, you know apply some of the startup startup methodologies in this? Uh, I think it would be really interesting uh, for our audience to hear kind of how do you stay young at the scale of two billion, right? And and keep keep innovating and finding the innovators. Well, I can give you a few recent examples of how we keep reinventing ourselves. First of all, I think it's you should really go out and just talk to customers. I mean, I think part of what me and my team do is we we try to minimize the amount of time we spend in time on planning documents and five year strategies and all these internal things. Like you, you're not going to learn very much from that. In fact, you're you're going to be in a little bit of an echo chamber. So just get out with customers. And and uh, I think the other thing is, I think so, people. So you've get, heard it here. Uh, you at Logitech, you don't hold internal meetings that much. It's it's all it's well, I, more I, I externally wish. focused. <laughs> no, there's stuff you have to do. I, I wish I could avoid it, but for, um, for the most part, we try to spend as much time yeah. outside, um, which is hard because I think the larger the company you are, in my experience, the more pressure there is to have just the internal conversations. And then I would say, be very careful about market research because I think the problem with that is you have someone asking questions. But a lot of times there's either garbage in, garbage out. Mm -hmm. um, or the person who's asking the question as a proxy for you doesn't know how to follow up. So if you're an expert in an area, I mean, I think one of the most powerful things is somebody says something to you and you're with them and you could say, tell me more, or you can drill down. And, and you, sometimes you get really unexpected answers. I mean, I'll get it. Or the other thing we do is just build prototypes and see if the idea works. Like, for example, we just launched this camera that is in the center of a conference room. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we did that is we started with something that one of our competitors did. So Cisco, who we really admired, market leader, had a video conferencing camera with four cameras in the front. So we built a prototype and we said, well, those guys are really smart. You know, this must be the right way to go. And then we built it. And we realized if you think about it, the angle, it doesn't really have a lot of value to have an angle like a few inches apart. Mm. So then we said, what you really want to do is have a camera that's got a completely different angle. So we jury rigged a prototype of a bunch of webcams, put it in the middle of the room, and then we we recorded it and we go, this is much better. It just gives you a different angle. So, you know, we're we're launching now a camera that and but then the other thing is there are some cameras in the middle of the room and some in the front of the room. And there was a debate. And some people said, which one do you want? And we go, you kind of want both because human beings move their heads around. You can't control them. Right. So we ended up coming up with a system that we just launched that has cameras in the front of the room and cameras in the center. Again, it goes back to our multi it goes back to the vision of it should be like a sporting event. You always want the best view. Um, so sometimes actually looking at your competitors doesn't work because you assume they're smart, but maybe they're not. And then the second thing is <laughs> build a real prototype, like have people use it rather than go build the whole product and realize that you wasted your time. Um, actually building the prototype route, we realized that we killed the product. We would have made a terrible mistake. So that's really fascinating. So like, so if you don't trust the market research and, and the competitors necessarily, right, who, who does inspire you? Right. And, you know, I, I was immediately thinking you kind of some of the, the way you were describing is it feels like Steve Jobs approach to inventing a new category of experiences and devices. Um, uh, but, but, um, you know, I'm also just really conscious that, you know, maybe you've, you've created your own system, but like, like, where do you get your inspiration other than your son and the customers, right? Like that, which I think is pretty, pretty good range <laughs> already. Yeah. I mean, I think Steve Jobs is a good example of, of uh, you know, if you think of the iPhone, he didn't invent anything, but he, he, he saw, served the need by things that already existed. Um, I like, I like the phrase, I don't know who said it, but you know, if, if, uh, Henry Ford had done market research, people would have told them they want a faster horse. I mean, the reality is most end users don't know what they want. They'll just tell you to give me more of something else. Oh, I have a, a camera that does eight X zoom. I need 16 X zoom. Why? Cause it's bigger, but, but that's, I think, and I, I've met with, worked with a lot of product people that that's the way they think like more is better. It not always the case. So I, I love the idea of design thinking, which I think is a overused generic term, but fundamentally of design thinking is you think about what someone does mm -hmm. and then what their pain points are. And then you design around it. I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm on this product that I'm using right now. It's called Logi Doc. Okay. And in the beginning of the pandemic, people were screaming at us saying, you need to build another webcam. 
but we looked at our webcams and we go, God, they're already pretty good. It's like, I don't even, quite frankly, I'm, I'm not even sure what we would do to make a better one. But we said, what are the problems of people working at home? And, and to your question, how do we figure out who the early adopters are? We actually looked at Logitech and we said, we're an early adopter of, of hybrid work, people working at home. Let's, let's take some pictures of people's desks. So we got like 80 pictures of people working remotely. And what we found is, first of all, their, their desks were super ugly. Like they had all these cables and wires everywhere. So they were just really terribly ugly. That was number one. Number two is their audio is awful. Like they're mm. using laptop audio. Their camera in some cases was in the wrong place. Like it was on the side of their right. monitor. So we, we basically built this product that I like to joke that no one asked us for. We built this collaboration doc that basically said, all right, great audio speakerphone controls for your video. Because one of the things we, we remember during the beginning of the pandemic, I would always miss my next meeting because I'd be really interested in the conversation. And somebody would be like, oh shit, I'm late. Yeah. So we, we put a little light indicator on the, on the dock that would light up when your next meeting is coming. And then the other thing we did is nobody can remember these stupid URLs and passcodes. So we created a button that you just hit and it automatically scrapes your calendar and starts your meeting. So we, we kind of, in, in a way, and then we created a dock which cleaned up all the cables in the back. So we created a product that no one asked us for, but kind of solved a problem that people had. It, it just won Time Magazine's top 200 inventions of the year. It's um, amazing. And, and, and nobody, nobody told us to go build a collaboration doc, but I think from talking through people's needs and, and looking what early adopters did, you know, it led us to that example. Well, th this is, this is a fantastic uh, reminder that also we, I'm not using that product, but our, our time together is wrapping up now, Scott. Uh, yeah. So I want to ask you one last question. So for, for our audience um, that's uh, made some, you know, uh, the investments into their digital experiences, right? Let's say they have Logitech products or they've, they've kind of upgraded um, their, their working space now. What do you think is going to be the next uh, investment in creating a great uh, digital experience, right? Like, and let's say in a use case where you're presenting something, what, what should we be worried about um, as communicators that really want to connect with their audience, you know, in the sort of through, through the video screens, right? Like now that we've reached the saturation, we now have more hybrid presences, you know, what should we just one, one or two things we should start thinking about individually? Well, I would say from my experience on video that anything that was bought before a year ago is obsolete now because we're moving to this multi-camera AI model. And if you are having meetings and you're dialing in in a hybrid way and you're remote and you have someone in a long meeting and you can't see or hear them properly and people are blocking them, that that is just obsolete compared to this new model of multi-camera AI driven camera technology. So you're gonna have to upgrade in a way that you had to upgrade your BlackBerry to an iPhone. Like it just, BlackBerry was great until it wasn't. All right. I think that's true of some of the uh, older video technology, including some of ours. I think the, the second thing is, and maybe cliche a little bit, but the AI, I think all software will be AI software. Every, every workflow will be disrupted in some way. Um, and, and I think it's, I don't find it threatening. I think it's just a lot of us have drudgery work creating PowerPoint, Excel, writing, editing. It's the ability to use some of these tools to be able to offload some of that, I think is great. I mean, one example on my team is just to do training and outreach to share information. We, uh, we had a whole training department. Um, one group of it was you know, basically writing the content. The other one was developing the curriculum and creating training. But what we realized with this new AI is I could have the content people actually directly write the script and give it to an AI avatar who can present it immediately in every language without any translation. And we didn't, need, we didn't actually need to have a team of trainers. So we're, we're using all AI avatars today <clears throat> and it's faster, quicker. And when the content people wanna change things as you inevitably wanna do, you don't have to re-edit it or format it. You just change right. the text and it updates it. So I think that's just one of many examples where AI already is like completely changing 
<clears throat> the workforce. And I'm sure that in terms of content management, translations, updating it, presentations, like we're going to go through a revolution and, and, uh, and I'm excited about that. Got it. So I got an idea for one of the episodes that's coming up. We're going to have the avatar kick it off and uh, and drive the original introduction and then we'll take over in, in yeah. multi multiple languages. But this is great. Scott, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Congratulations on an amazing journey uh, from startups to driving, you know, a, a, a niche uh, uh, you know, brand new offering to $2 billion in revenue. I hope uh, our audience really takes advice of a, of a practitioner and uh, that that's created amazing experiences. And I'm, I'm really rooting for Logitech to continue to redefine meetings into really truly human experiences that they were once upon a time uh, and, uh, and making, you know, redefining the future was that. Thank you again. Thanks a lot, Alex. Great to be with you and, and uh, wonderful to be able to share some of these ideas with your audience. So thank you. Thanks.